Welcome to the official YouTube channel for the Colin Coward Podcast. Go on, hit the subscribe button. There you go, right down there. If you wanna be among the first to hear my weekly takes, NFL, college football, more, right there. All right, Nick Wright's about to stop on by. We're going to go probably blow through an hour to an hour and a half today. we got a lot of things to talk about. Um, hey, before we do that with Nick Wright, I want you to download the Game Time app. It takes 90 seconds. I've used it. It's easy. The Game Time app, authorized ticket marketplace for Major League Baseball. Tickets get cheaper the closer you get to the first pitch. And the thing about baseball, now the games matter more, first of all. Second of all, baseball is one of those sports because there's 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 a big volume of games. A lot of times I've decided to go to a baseball game in an afternoon. Somebody calls, boom, I got two tickets, you go. Game time, by the way, if you put in the redeem code, Colin, C-O-L-I-N, $20 off your first purchase. Take the guesswork out of buying Major League Baseball tickets with the Game Time app. You download the Game Time app, put in the code Colin, 20 bucks off your first purchase. The Game Time app. Lowest prices guaranteed, last minute tickets, really, really easy for people with busy lives. Game time makes things simple, quick, and a $20 off discount. Here's an interesting topic, and I, and I bring this up because you're one of the bigger NBA fans, is that some things don't sound, don't sound comforting. And they may sound almost appalling, but they're true. And that treating your employees and paying them more than they deserve is really bad business. And that the reason the NFL is king, it's virtually impossible to find a bad contract in the league. I can remember Albert Hainsworth for about a year, got paid a ton with the Patriots. Yeah. You remember it because it's so infrequent. Yeah. It may be the only bad contract sure. for the Patriots. Every NBA team has a terrible contract. Some have three. You know, before James Dolan got distracted by the sphere, it was like half the half the contracts for the Knicks were bad contracts. Is that one of the reasons that the NFL is king is because they have a weak union, and that sounds terrible to say. Players have, like Brandon Ayuk, they're like, no, we're not going to cave. There's a bunch of good receivers in next year's draft. We'll just go draft him. Now, I think they want him. They're furious. They know that the window's shrinking. Their players are getting older. But I think, I, and I've talked to a lot of guys in the NBA. I saw Frank Vogel the other night at dinner. You know, LA, you see a lot of pro coaches, like it, sure. it, especially where I live. They're all in the beach communities. And football coaches are happier. Basketball coaches are all miserable, even the successful ones. And the reason being is they have cost certainty. They have control. Um, in the NFL, you can be productive, but you're a pain in the ass. I'm moving off you. I mean, seven rounds of players, half the league's undrafted. In the NBA, after the 14th pick, you run out of players. And this Brandon Ayuk situation is interesting because in the NBA, he would get paid. And he may go to coach fired. And in the NFL, they're like, no, we got a bunch of good players. Draft will give us nine receivers. We'll give you a number. I mean, you're going to make like 23 million. You're not making 30. And I think it really, so my point being is, it not giving the employee everything they want is why the NFL succeeds. It forces players to get their shit together. Like you don't get that nine year baseball contract. We're like year four, five, and six. You're like, I'm getting my money. The union's so strong. And Brandon Ayuk, the Niners are saying, take it or leave it. Take it or leave it. Well, all right. So I, I actually, I, so I think I look at, I, I, my, I agree with some of what you're, you're a saying. union guy. But I, I wanted the, well, uh, yes, I'm definitely a union guy, but I, I look at this, I look at the NBA and the Ayuk thing separately. So let me deal with the NBA thing first. I actually think a huge part of the issues that you're describing with the NBA are caused by the individual player max. I yeah. think so many of the, if the NBA salary cap was $150 million, and if you wanted to give joker 140 you of could. it you could so many of these pro so many of the complaints of the nba go away to for two reasons one is one of the reasons nba guys get uh get what i would call non-contract benefits 
which is, I don't want to practice today. Let's not practice today. Though Those types of things is because if you're artificially capping what you can pay them and everyone can pay them the same, you have to pay them elsewhere. You have to be like, okay, you're actually worth a hundred million a year. I can only pay you 50. So, and everyone can pay you 50. So therefore we have to give you these fringe benefits, like, you know, what they give college football coaches, country club memberships, whatever, in order to make up that delta. The other thing the individual player cap does is it makes it to where the middle class NBA is wildly overpaid. And that's what fans, people think fans are going to get pissed when NBA guys are making a million a game. They're not. They're they're not going to be mad when Jason Tatum, who's the best player on a champion, makes a million a game, not more mad than there are right now when he makes half a million a game where people will get mad is when they got mad at Tobias Harris. They're like, wait, you're the 63rd best player in the league and you're making 30 million a year. But that exists because of the individual player max. So that's the, that's the first, that's the NBA part. In my opinion, the Ayuk thing, what I think is fascinating about Ayuk is People are wondering, why are the Niners going to cave? Why are the Niners, who are going to get nothing back of substance for this season, when they've got to win, when it's the last year, theoretically, when Purdy's cheap and Trent's $36 why are they going to cave and trade him at an inopportune time? And I said it on the show today, and I think it's – I think people – I think this will resonate with people if they think not of NFL teams, but of their own workplace, which is, it is the leverage Ayuk has is, I can make it miserable here. And people don't think about that. Think about any workplace you've been in where someone who's important and unfireable or ish comes in, has a bad attitude, is shit talking other people is bringing the morale like bringing every room they walk you they walk into you like oh that kills the vibe that kills working anywhere and i think that is oddly the leverage iuk has the leverage iuk has is this can be miserable guys and if people doubt how much of an impact that can have read the espn article today on what happened to the eagles Eagles were 10 and one. They had won like 23 of 25 yeah. games, went to a Super Bowl, did all that. And then what happened to them? Well, it seems like the coach and the quarterback couldn't be in a room one on one together, and the whole thing collapsed. So I think, oddly, the leverage Ayuk has or any of these guys have is I can be a dick and I can make team meetings and the locker room suck. And you, and if I'm too good to cut, what are you going to so, do? But I think in the NFL, people just move on. I think in the NBA, you don't. Yes. But in the NFL, that part's totally yeah, true. I mean, I've said, I said this today, I would take that um, university of Washington offensive lineman, first round guy. I'll say you can have Iuke. You have to pay him though. We'll take that offensive lineman. And the fans will think what a terrible deal, but the Niners biggest weakness is their offensive line. That's of Trent Williams. Give us your first pick because Iuke's worth a first rounder. We just want a guy that can play now. And the Steve and and by the yep. way, he's not scheduled to start for the Steelers this year anyway. And by the way, the other part is that offensive coaches, I will say this till I die, are better with offensive line than defensive coaches. Andy Reid and Sean McVay reboot that thing every two years brilliantly. Mike Tomlin can't get he cannot figure the offensive line out. Pete Carroll at the Seahawks, <laughs> great draft picks, couldn't figure it out. He hired terrible low line coaches. Sean McDermott. Outside of left tackle, revolving door, can't figure the offensive line out. McVay and Reed, Sean Payton goes to the Broncos. It's terrible. Last year, his first on line, seventh by PFF. Dotson was a guard. The Steelers was not going to start for the Steelers. Sean Payton gets him for like a fifth round pick. Sean McVay gets him for a fifth round pick for the Rams. He's the highest rated guard in the league last year. Was not going to start for the Steelers. Really? So, yeah. So my takeaway is, Give him Ayuk. We'll take that. We'll take that interior offensive lineman. The fans will think we got just used, but we don't have to pay that kid for four years. You got to pay. Oh it. well, no. I think that would be a great deal. Listen, if you, if that's the guy, the the 
Steelers spent their first round pick on this is past it, year. Is worth is a it, first was round it pick. New? Is that who yeah, you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, a hundred percent. And right. And the problem with the problem with trading Ayuk is not trading Ayuk. It's trading Ayuk in August if the compensation is next year's right. draft when you're trying to win this year's Super Bowl. Like the I was, I don't know if you remember it, but I was you broke the news to me live on TV that Tyree Kill had been yeah. traded. I was on with yeah. you and it happened. Yeah. Um, and in the moment I was beside myself and then the details came out and then I had more time and a little, I, I will admit this is a little bit playing the result because the chiefs haven't, you know, they've won every Super Bowl that's been played since the trade, but the key was they're going to get four players for this year's team. Like it was happening before. So they're going to lose Tyreek. And they got a first round pick, a, you know, a third, a fifth, or whatever it was. But the draft hadn't happened yet. And so it's like, oh, they're going to be able to improve these different things and use it right now, as opposed to trading post draft for future picks, which is just always such a bummer. It's like, man, he's going to help us today, yeah. and you're trading him for help down the road. That's fine to do if you're a rebuilding team that doesn't care about winning. But the Niners. Best chance of winning a Super Bowl that hasn't already happened is right yes. now. Because Brock Purdy is going to go from wildly underpaid, no matter what you think of him, to comically overpaid, yep. no matter what you think of him. So the window is this moment. Um, and that, I mean, I think, listen, I believe that the, there, he's going to the Steelers. Andrew Filipponi out of Pittsburgh said the Niners and Steelers have agreed they're waiting on Ayuk and the Steelers to come to terms on the money. I also, can I ask you another Ayuk question sure. before you move on to other stuff? Is it a little odd to you that Ayuk is this much more interested in Pittsburgh than New England? Because I Pittsburgh does not have a settled quarterback situation. Right. We don't know who it is. New England, I get it's a rookie. It's the third pick of the draft. He wanted to go to Washington, who has the second pick of the draft. Now, I understand he played with Jaden before. But it was, the reporting out of New England is, they offered upwards of $32 million yeah. a year. The Niners accepted the terms, and Ayuk was like, I won't play there. That would make sense if it's like, no, I want to go to Baltimore and play with Lamar. I want to go to Buffalo and play with Josh Allen. But it's like, no, I won't play with the Patriots and their defensive-minded head coach with... Drake May at quarterback because I want to go to the Steelers who are having a quarterback competition between a first round pick that might wash out and Russell Wilson on his third team. That's weird to me that I can't quite figure. So players are all, and this is not a criticism, but a reality selfish. And they probably should be a GM can GM forever. An owner owns forever. A coach can coach until the seventies. A player's got like seven peak years in football and then it's over. So they're selfish. Yeah. So if you were 22, 23 years old and you looked around the NFL, if I said to you, you could go to this place, it is player friendly. You can be dramatic. You can talk trash. Okay, that's that makes sense. Pittsburgh is a player heaven. Tomlin's not a big disciplinarian. Tomlin, I mean, Tomlin almost ran onto the field to make a tackle himself once. He is the well, yeah. He almost he, tripped the late Jacoby. He Jones. is yeah. very motivational. It's like Pete Carroll was viewed player friendly. That's why when he didn't pay Earl Thomas, Earl Thomas flipped him off because it was like players just thought Pete gets guys paid, right. and pay so everybody. So when you think of New England, their brand is rigid, the crafts, not player friendly. Take yeah. a pay cut, even though it may not be the reality now that Brady and Belichick are gone. The brand of New England is cold. Boston is sort of fences make good neighbors. It's get, Pittsburgh is a good time for players. So, I, I mean, that's got to be it because it, it can't be. I understand wide receiver being like quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. But, and I don't love Drake May, but he's third pick of the draft. Yeah. Like, it's the Patriots would not have traded the third pick of the draft for Russell Wilson and Justin Fields. <laughs> that, like, that that would not have happened. Yeah. So it's just, it, that part is weird to me. I want to ask you one sure. other thing before I, I know this. No. no. Um, I read that ESPN article about Sirianni and yeah. Hurts. And man, oh man, 
it reminded me a lot of what we learned about Carol and Russell Wilson, which is make a Super Bowl with a quarterback that some believed in, some didn't. The coach still views the quarterback a certain way. The quarterback then's like, no, I view myself a different way. I got paid and I want to play a different way. And it obviously for Carol and Wilson, it lasted for years and then it broke up at the end. But when I when I'm reading that Sirianni still wanted run the ball, do certain things, and Jalen Hurts like, you paid me $250 million. I'm gonna show you what I can do. It reminded me so much of Pete and Russ at the end. That for Philly, I think there's all the Philly has a, a really good roster. There are a lot of big warning signs yes. about it, the GM well, picked the coordinators here, that the head coach and quarterback are not on the same page. That was not a great article. No, but the difference is, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. So Russell Wilson has had three different coaches, three, his college coach. He was a wildly successful, productive college quarterback. His coach basically said, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with Mike Glennon." Yes, Pete Carroll, two Super Bowls with him. I'm over you. Sean Payton actually resurrected him a little bit. He wasn't the problem, and said, "Go." So three away. coaches, different levels of success, bailed on him. That tells me that is a Russell Wilson issue. I've had multiple teammates rip him, like notable guys. Yep. So there's a Russell component here. And I think nothing, I'm not being, you know, anti-Russ, but when three things happen, if you rob three banks, you're a bank robber. No, that's right. And, and with, <laughs> and where it's the, the it, it's funny. You brought up the NC state thing. I think that's relevant. Yes. I think it's like, wait, so that was a, that was it. And then he goes to Wisconsin and is awesome. It's like, he keeps aside from in Denver, he produces everywhere and the coaches seem really hesitant to give him the full keys to the car, which is a weird yeah. thing. With that said, Colin, Jalen Hurts okay. did have to transfer right. from Alabama. Yeah, But Go the ahead. difference is Pete Carroll, college and pro, is a, is a championship-level coach. So when Sirianni got the job, um, I called – I have six GMs on my phone, a couple scouting directors – and we talk all the time. And I called various people. And I didn't really actually want to call Chris Ballard because I didn't want to put Chris in a bad spot. So he wasn't one of the ones I called because Ballard, he came from Indianapolis. Yeah. So it's it like, like yep. for instance, I can I can text Brett Veach and ask him a quarterback question because I know he's not drafting one. Right. But I right, right, sure. right, right. but sense. I didn't want to ask Tom Telesco, a friend, about Tua and Justin Herbert because I knew he needed one and I didn't think it was fair for me to poke and prod in that space. So I tend sure. to use <clears throat> use I tend to source my people non sensitive areas that are new, right? Not neutral parties on whatever you're right, talking about. Right. So you ask Ballard about Sirianni so, when he was there. Now I can hard, ask so him ask now about Sirianni. I felt comfortable asking Chris sure. post success into a Super Bowl, but I called yeah. two people. Two people that I went and looked up Sirianni's resume, where he'd been, two people, both said the same thing. I don't know if he's ready. I don't know if he's great on his side of the ball yet. And there's a distinction here. You can bang on Jim Harbaugh, but he gets the offense right everywhere fast. You can you can bang on um, uh, Nick Saban. He didn't win big at Michigan State or LSU. Year four, he was losing games. The defense gets better immediately wherever Nick Saban was, including the Miami Dolphins. Uh, Lincoln Riley, offense is brilliant the minute he arrives. Yep. Nick Sariani, that article at ESPN said people didn't respect his X's and O's on offense. X's and O's. Like, I and know. So that, that literally was exactly what I heard from my sources, which was uh, uh, he's not good enough on his side of the ball. He's not viewed as an expert. Like, like I'll give you another one. Matt Eberflus, you can say what you want. That was the best defense in the league the last seven weeks of the year, and they didn't have the best personnel. As soon as they got one pass yeah, it's like, so like Right, which is why I think... Yeah, yeah, so you can say what you want. Like Steve Spurrier may not have been the best this, this, this. His offenses were good at Duke. They were great at Florida. Like, he knew offense. So I, I, the difference with the, the Jalen Hurts thing is, is the, yes, he did transfer, and there may be some of that, 
but there's a competent coach in Pete Carroll and one in Nick Sirianni. I mean, that opening press conference was a glimpse into he was over his skis when he got that job. Well, so listen, and I also think you can't have your coach be a shit talker unless you're a team of shit talkers. If you're sorry, my dog's running around, but he's it's fine. Um, if you're a if if everyone on your team is you know taunting and whatever, and that's the motif you want to have, especially if your coach is maybe a former player, then maybe you can get away with it. But I th- what you can't have is a totally buttoned up team led by a quarterback who is like the best press conference in the league. And then a coach he's screaming at fans and taunting. You can't have that. That part I totally agree with. My concern is on the flip side, which is, man, we've seen Jalen Hurts play big time football for seven years. There's only been one. He looked like an NFL franchise quarterback. Is it ne- never in college? At no point with Philly, except for the Super Bowl year. And he was brilliant that yeah. year. And he was amazing in the Super Bowl. I just don't know. I think that what happened to Peterson and Wentz absolutely could happen to Sirianni and Hurts, yeah. which is that they're both gone within three yeah. years of the yeah. Super Bowl. I think that's on the no, board. No, I think it is. And what also concerns you, you know, it used to be this rule, don't draft a Jeff Tedford quarterback in the NFL because all of his college yes. quarterbacks look amazing, right? Right? Yes. And then, and so... um he literally the Alabama. So the other thing with, with her to Shane Steichen. So the uh-huh. m- pre Steichen calling the plays, not good. Post Steichen leaves the building. Not good. You know, the 20 games and Steichen almost got Gardner Minshew to the damn playoffs. No, last I mean, year. that's why when the Raiders I- go and get Gardner Minshew, I said this the other day on the air, you're not getting the Indianapolis Gardner Minshew. That that's not what you're no. getting. And by the way, Shane Steichen, the best Justin Herbert ever was, was the first year where Shane Steichen. <laughs> he was. Oh, I didn't even remember that he was there. It, yeah, I mean that is that, he literally set rookie that is records. 100%. Anthony Richardson is he good? Well, he's got Shane Steichen. He'll be good. So yeah, I mean that. Well, that's why, man. I think the Colts could be. Listen, Anthony Richardson has barely played more pro football than Jaden Daniels. You know what I mean? I mean it's it's like sixty snaps. Right. I understand that. But man, what I saw was impressive. Oh, yeah. And coming out of Florida, it I thought the book on him from the people that watched more Florida than me was all right, amazing physical yeah. gifts, but it, you know, two years away from being an NFL ready quarterback. Yes. Then I saw him play and I'm like, seemed pretty <laughs> fucking ready to me. Like I he got hurt a lot, but I mean, oh, it, yeah. it didn't seem like the game was too fast for him, any of it. Now, maybe he's, the fact that he suffered two significant injuries in four games makes you think maybe, you know, that's going to be a problem. I don't know. But Indy's a, that whole division to me is interesting because you have Jacksonville, which I, you know, I, I can't quit my guy, Trevor. Yeah. I still believe in him. The Texans, who, you know, some people are going to, you know, that will be the trendy team. They're like, this is the team that will beat the Chiefs this year that people like. And then no one's going to be on Indy or Tennessee. Now, I don't like the the direction of the Titans. And I don't trust Levis. But the Titans, you know who thinks the Titans are competing? The Titans, who are spending money and doing things like a team that can win. And then there's the Colts just sitting there. Like, hey, guys, we were a completion away from being in the playoffs last year. They were playing in week 18 on Sunday Night Football for the playoffs. And if Richardson's good, man, they could be a a dangerous team. Hey, are you not playing best ball at DraftKings? My opinion, you're missing out. DraftKings Best Ball Millionaire Contest is their biggest fantasy contest ever. And that's saying something. They're taking $15 million and putting it into the prize pool. $15 $15 million. Two millionaires, not one, two, will be crowned each week. Still not convinced? Check this out. DraftKings offering everybody a draft one, get one special. Your $20 entry fee, and that's all it costs to get involved, 20 bucks. This is really nice. Gives you a bonus ticket. Get in on the best ball action. Download the DraftKings app. Takes 90 seconds. Use the code Colin, C O L I N. All customers who enter the NFL Best Ball $15 million millionaire contest get a bonus ticket and get a shot at being crowned 
one of two millionaires only on DraftKings. So I had an um I had a couple of Olympic team rants today. And okay. I said one of the things I said with KD, I said actually being the all time leading scorer cements his legacy. So KD is salt to a chef. He makes everything better. Eggs, caramel, it doesn't matter. You put him on any team. He got to the finals with Westbrook. LeBron couldn't decode Westbrook, right? He he made the Warriors the best team arguably ever. Even in Brooklyn, he was outstanding. The fact that his teammate wouldn't get the vaccine, there's only so much you can do. So, And then you put him on this team. And I said, if you look at even great players, you put Tatum around great players, he kind of shrinks. Steph has to adjust. Embiid clogs it. LeBron takes a leadership role, but won't score as much. KD works everywhere. Now, as long as you don't ask him to lead, don't ask him to do that. Just ask him to fit. He is the salt to the chef. Oh, we've got it. Everything will taste great tonight. So that is, that's, go ahead. So, finish, sorry. So it's perfect that he on a collection of the world's best players that 30 years from now in a bar, you'll be like, who's the leading scorer? Jordan. No. What? Well, it was Curry. Not even close. LeBron. Nope. Not close. Okay. Well, time out. Let, let me think. Was it, uh, well, let's go back to the Olympics. Uh, was it, uh, Bill Bradley? Will. No, no, no. It's Kevin Durant. And you'll be like, Oh, fuck yeah, it is. Like, because when you ask players, yeah, so Mark Few is a buddy of mine. He coaches the Olympics assistant. Years ago, I said, I just asked him, like, like, tell me one thing that's just crazy about coaching the Olympics. And he just went, Kevin Durant, man. <laughs> that's all he said, right? So the, so the, he is probably, if you take the, this is something Brew hasn't said this exact thing, but he's basically said a different version of it. And I think he's right. Take the 20 greatest players ever. Okay. He's somewhere yeah. on that, close to 20, yeah. but on there. There is not a single one of them that you can simply drop on every great team in NBA history. And it definitely works, other than Durant. I totally agree. Like totally and, agree. And that it, it does not matter the era, the rules, <laughs> the what 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 redundancy they already have anything. Drop him on any great team and it works. No great it, and so that is and your point is I think if Ke if Kevin heard this, he would say that's what I've been saying. <laughs> <laughs> which is I don't want to be the leader. I it, when I'm asked about leadership, I'm like that's the coach's job. I you know what I want to do is play basketball. Yeah. And you know what everyone seems to say I'm awesome at playing basketball. And you guys tar me. I think again, this is what I think Kevin would say. With I'm a bad leader. But luckily my job is basketball player, not leader. So fuck off. <laughs> like I think that's what he'd say. And it's like, it's not a terrible argument, except for the fact that it seems like the other guys in that room of greatness are kind of able to multitask it or have somebody alongside them who's also great, who can do it for them. And so it is, it is such a unique thing because I do think, I do think Durant is I, I've told you this on the podcast before, but I'll say it again. I had somebody who is super close with one of the greatest players ever, and it's not Durant, say, if you if we were to line the 20 greatest players up and they're all at their peak on a blacktop, and ask someone who didn't know about resumes or anything, whatever, who they wanted, who they think the best guy is. And you described, it's like, okay, they point at Michael Jordan. 
And it's like, all right, tell me about that guy. It's like, well, he he's average size, amazing athlete, good, not great shooter, crazy, crazy competitor. Um, they'd be like, okay, next. They point at Shaq. I mean, it, it, the most dominant physical force uh, is, you know, going to come and go with effort, is going to be a liability at the free throw line, but is going to give you a guaranteed 30. Okay, no problem. They point at LeBron. All right, not the best shooter in the room, not the best dribbler, probably the best passer, um, and is probably the best athlete. Okay. What about that guy? Oh, Durant? Well, he's the second tallest person here. He's also the second best shooter. He's also the fourth best dribbler. He also <laughs> can pass. He can defend. And they'd be like, well, I'm fucking taking him. They're like, wait, he's the second tallest and the second best shooter? They're like, oh, yeah, he can do that. Is he durable? Well, he's going to play 20 years. Like, the can is he a terrible defender? No, he can, he can, you know, credibly guard a bunch of spots. But despite that, He's probably kind of underachieved. And I like, so I like all of those things are true. And it's because of that leadership component that he has been honest about. Like, I don't think that's my job, so I'm not going to do it. And I think it's fascinating because the, when uh, he looks his best around the best and then other guys, when they're around the best, you're like, oh, you're a grade lower like Tatum. Tatum's around the best, and it's like, oh, you're just a grade lower. Durant's around the best, and you're like, are you the best player alive? <laughs> like, it's such a fascinating thing. Yeah, no, and I, I, I think, um, somebody said this once that the greatest athletes, you wouldn't really want them to be your boss because they have such bad personal tendencies. They're very selfish. They're relentless. They're harsh. I mean, Jordan could be just not, just not a giver, a taker. Same sure. with the late Kobe Bryant. But Kevin Durant actually would be a fun hang. Like he would be, you could do 82 games and it'd be like, he'd get a drink with you. Uh, you know, there you would just, he would make you laugh. When you were having a bad day, he'd put his arm around you and go, that's okay, bro. Let's just go hoop it. I totally agree yeah. with this. I, and I, it's one of the, and I've tried kind of, I don't want to say behind the scenes, but I know some people that are tight with Kevin. Yeah. And listen, at one point, I, you know, I know, I know definitively that Kevin, you know, thought kind of, I was one of the people's kind of a problem with the media. Yeah. And that's like, that's his right. That's fine. But I have tried to kind of through back channels, like political stuff, like try to set up a situation where he and I could sit and talk basketball or sit and talk. Because over the last four years, I have grown to have such affection, if you will, for kind of just how comfortable he is in his own skin. Like the He's gone a long way from the burners and all that stuff. It's like, nah, if I think you're full of shit on the internet, I'm going to tell you. Like, I thought it was hilarious that like a, a couple days into the Olympics on an off day, he was arguing with strangers on the internet on Twitter. <laughs> It's like, dude, you're a, you got half a billion dollars. You're single. You're wildly famous in the Olympic Village in Paris. And you're like, I got to get these tweets off, man. I don't care. <laughs> I'm going to sit here and argue with you guys about basketball. And I was like, I just, I found it charming. Yeah. And I also think he has such an immense respect for the game itself that I really like. So I like yeah. Durant. I really like Durant and I do, I agree with you. Like it, he would, I do think he'd be a great guy to be, have, uh, you know, to be on a team with. And I do think he'd be of all the superstars, one of the best hangs. And that's also, it's also probably helpful. He's one of the only superstars of that level. That's still like a single guy, like hanging out with the fellas, like Steph and LeBron, everybody's married with kids. Durant's just like, nah, I'm going to play video games, smoke a little <laughs> weed, and, and play basketball. <laughs> like, I don't know about you guys. It's a hell of a life, man. No, it is. Um, so I'm going to throw this out because you and I, I don't talk a lot of politics. Um, but it, it, there are things. No, but whenever you do, you go viral, yeah. man. The the, the 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 internet had you clocked as a hardcore right-winger. 
just I know. Well, it's just you're just old, white, and rich. That's all. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so, because, so weird. So because of that, they just assumed it. So every time you say anything yeah. that isn't like MAGA hat wearing Trumper stuff, there are corners of the internet that are just throw parties. Like I think today, that's what I was telling you before the show. Today, you just said like saw Kamala Harris. She wasn't pointing angry and she was smiling, made me feel good. And there are like important political accounts are like Colin Cowherd says what Kamala Harris is going to win the election. <laughs> so they're just so happy about it. It just it delights me every time I see it. But go ahead. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'm excited where this is going to go. So it was, first of all, whenever anybody in any situation in life is trying to convince me that something's true too hard like, why are you doing that? I'm that's where I'm kind of cynical as a person. Like, don't if something's like even when people have pitched me businesses, the the, the couple of businesses that I've uh, bought a stake in a business or both times where I really somebody came up and said, Hey, I think you'll like it. I'll send you a deck. I think it's interesting. I've never ever purchased any part of a company when you hard sell me. Same with a car. I'll walk in, I'll tell you what I like. I'm quick, cut to the chase, get me the contract. Yep. So, um, you know, they're they're the conservatives are trying to um, vice presidents don't decide elections. They can hurt you. They're like baseball managers. They don't win many games. They can lose you games if they lose the locker room. So, yep. who, so Kamala's uh, vice president Tim Walls. He's he not going to. He it doesn't really matter because he'll just get out of the way. He's a high school football coach. He was well-liked. He's not deciding this thing. They do appear to really like each other. That matters. J.D. Yep. Vance could hurt you. Um, that's the worst kind yes. of VP pick where he could actually pull a point or two down or lose your state. So very quickly, he says something about uh, women uh, without kids. And I'm like, oh, you guys are struggling with women. I wouldn't go there. He did something today. And by the time this airs, it will have been discussed ad nauseum by the political pundits. But I thought to myself, oh, oh, I wouldn't do that. So he went to Kamala's plane, Air Force One. I saw this too. To try so they were both landing. If people don't yeah. know, they his plane and Air Force Two, I guess, is the one she's on, uh, both land in the same airfield. And so he walked, so they, they both happened to be in the same place. So he walked over. So now you take and it over was, and say what happened. So it was almost as if he was trying to kind of intimidate her. And I thought, time out. You already pissed off a lot of women who, by the way, would love children, but they can't have them. I've known. Oh, right. right. So, so okay, that's, so that's the, first. Go ahead. Then you combine it with, I'm going to try to intimidate our potentially first female president and i really thought oh christ D trump may have it this could like this is a baseball oh, this is yeah. bobby valentine taking over the red Sox, pissing off dustin pedroia and he was gone like 30 games later it was like holy god this is a and i think to myself no because i tend to be moderate but lean left i'm not going to overreact it's just a vice president they don't matter but I saw that and I thought, that's really bad judgment. Am I overreacting? So, that, so no, I listen, I, I think that, so I'll go macro to micro. I think that anyone, this is the problem with being a phony, is you're never acting on instinct, you're acting wait, the person I'm trying to pretend I am, how would they act? And you fuck it up all the time. That's my my my, my honest dyed-in-the-wool opinion of J.D. Vance is, he's, I have no idea who he is. It's not this guy he's cosplaying as. I know that because he's been in the public eye for a long time. And you can come around on things. Yeah. You can change positions. Have, yeah. But you can't write a book about the opioid epidemic and then call Donald Trump an opiate an opioid as a slur about how this is how bad it is. It ruined my family, ruined my area. He, he'd say to people, he reminds you of Hitler and change enough to where you're like, 
I want to be his vice president. <laughs> Nobody changes that right. much like that. The, 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 and, but so his, he, what he has done super successfully is navigate from, you know, a guy who wrote a book that people liked to up until the day Biden dropped out, the overwhelming likely vice next vice president of the United States. He navigated that in an incredibly short period of time because his true north was, what do I need to say and do to achieve the next rung of power? And it has worked. But more often than not, yeah. At some point, that bill comes yeah. due. And that bill is coming due right now because the guy can't make, can't do anything on instinct. Right. Everything's like, wait, what am I supposed to do in this spot? And so there's, it's so every time he talks, it's like, what, why'd you say that? Like today, some local reporter is, is said to him, some friendly local reporter was like, you know, one of the things you're criticized about is that you don't smile enough. What is something that makes you smile? And the answer to that question is literally anything. My kids, a baseball game, the flag of the United States. And his answer was, well, I smile when I laugh at ridiculous questions like that from the fake media. And I'm like, that's not what you wanted to say, buddy. But you think that's what you're supposed right. to say. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think in general... Like when you're not able to have at least something of a consistent, like I understand all politicians pander yeah. and change positions. I get that. But this is such a yeah. dramatic turn of events. He seems like a different person. The other thing on the first thing you said about the, the, the reason it re he's in real trouble is the comments about childless women. And this is, I will admit, I'm about to say something overtly political. Okay. So this is one of my biggest problems with the so many of our super conservative politicians. I actually don't know how much they they truly understand about how babies are made and the human reproductive system and all of it. Because J.D. Vance would tell you, I I I was talking about people that don't want to have children. And I think that's bullshit. I think that if you're choosing not to have kids, you're not as, as important of a citizen as someone that wants to start a family. I think he truly believes that. Fine, whatever. I think that's wrong, but at least I can get, he's like, you have more of an investment. But it's such a fundamental misunderstanding that so many people and families desperately want to have yes. kids. And the biggest tragedies of their life are that they haven't been able to. Or, I mean, I will, I'll tell something very personal because she shared it publicly. Um, my sister mm -hmm. had a child and everything was fine, seemingly, with my nephew. Well, everything is fine with my nephew, but everything was fine with the pregnancy. And then over the next four years, had four of the most excruciating miscarriages anyone can imagine and then had basically a miracle baby who's now my niece there are so many f women out there that the biggest tragedy of their yes. lives is through no fault of yes. their own they can't That's have right. kids and this then this guy yeah. is and, and the reason i said i don't think they know how babies are made that's a little tongue-in-cheek but my point is if you have that at all in your consciousness that, oh, wait, there's a lot of people that want to have kids that are struggling having kids, then you'd be more careful with your words. You wouldn't say things like childless women. You would find a way to make your point, which is you know, essentially that people that have decided I want to be lifelong bachelor or I want to be lifelong single is the point you're really trying to make that you don't think they have as much skin in the game as someone who has kids and grandkids. And again, the, I don't know that I agree with that take, but that's a take that you can at least defend. But when you just flippantly throw this stuff out there, it's like, man, there's people are understand people that want to root for you and vote for you are going to say, 
You're saying I count less? Yeah. I, 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 I voted for Trump twice. Not me. I'm this theoretical person. And because I, 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 I can't have a baby, I can't let, like, that's going to cost you. And you said, you know, I think that if this had happened three months ago, he would have changed his mind. But I think Trump's in a weird spot yeah. because he can't kick JD off the ticket after he made fun of Biden for dropping out. Like, man, this is a quick last 20 days Bad. is a pretty quick turnaround as far as the odds now we're a long ways yeah. out a lot can change but i felt like trump was some of my friends in the high stakes gambling community the poker that's what i watch were For presidential elections trump, i yes. watch the gaming market yes so, so so some of the best poker players in the world the week before biden dropped out were betting trump at minus 200 to minus 220 and as of this moment, it's Kamala minus 110, a tiny, tiny favorite in three weeks. I mean, it's been three weeks. That is a wild turn of events on how of this uh, on how this thing flipped so quickly in the markets. Again, in the markets. I mean, the, the, the audience knows who I'm voting yeah, for, yeah. but that's fine. Well, and that, that also includes an assassination attempt, which should have literally right. with an iconic photo guaranteed him the election. <laughs> I mean, it was like in a weird way. I, I, I saw that photo and I was like, Oh boy. Yeah. That's uh well, it's over. over. Yeah. No, to, to squander that much goodwill and a lead and the, all of it in record time also then makes you, it, it, it I'm very interested in how these next couple months go. Yeah. Because and by the way, now listen, you can still win. Like things change, yeah. but man, Trump, Trump when he thinks he's losing, his historically doesn't act less unhinged. <laughs> he doesn't like. Okay, now's the time to be disciplined. <laughs> now's the time to stay on message right. about taxes. Like I just don't think that's coming. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's funny. It, well, I, I've always laughed at this stick to sports thing, and I'm always like, well, then you stick to not lecturing me on how to produce a radio show or a podcast. Is my take is everybody gets an opinion on politics because in the summer months in election years there's nothing going on i mean if it wasn't for the olympics what in the hell would any of us talk about because nobody plays in the preseason sean mcvay neutered it when he didn't play anybody and went eight no to start the season so the truth is i like people even if they're um not particularly gifted orders or um they're not pundits i'm i'm interested in different i like different political opinions. I've said this before. Fans call sports radio shows. On average, they're dreadful. They're repetitive. They have nothing creative to say, yeah. but, but, but there is value. If you're doing like I do a simulcast, but if you do strictly a radio broadcast of having the occasional argumentative call, the call that's absurdly yeah, it's wrong. Great. I mean, it's, yeah. it was Mike and the mad dog. Like some of the funniest moments are just idiotic calls um you know it it, it is part of the theater yeah. so i like i of i don't course. i like people to have different opinions i glean all sorts of information you don't have to be an expert i mean i I've, I've said this before um football coaches have acknowledged like you know a fan andy reads like a fan sent me a play and we kind of yeah we're yeah. like well, somebody the guy that works one of the janitorial staff drew he's something like yeah, it's kind of yeah. interesting uh, also and I, I also, I, if, if, if someone decides I'm simply someone in our field decides I'm simply never talking about it. Um, so that's fine. Like I get that. Sometimes that's an edict. Yeah. Sometimes it's a, um, it's, uh, it's, just, you know, it's strategy. That's fine. What I don't love is if someone does talk about it and clearly is afraid to be honest about how they yeah. feel like so i stay out of one of the reasons i i rarely talk about this is because i'm not a moderate i don't pretend to be like i like i my politics are i think some people consider them extreme that's fine but i'm not gonna i, I the i'm not going to 
all of a sudden act like, well, you know, up until, you know, a couple months before my, I was undecided. I, you know, no, I wasn't like, I, sorry, my dogs were being annoying. Like I wasn't undecided. Yeah. And in my lifetime, since I've been, uh, you know, old enough to vote, I've voted Democrat every election. Um, so if I'm going to talk about it, I'm going to be honest yeah. with, you know, with folks and, about but, where I stand. But it's on. interesting because a lot of people, I'll give you an example, think uh, if I don't bring up politics, uh, you're being woke. I'll give you an example. I think one of the things I've done well in my career, and this is really boring, but I think I'm really good at it, is topic selection. Is I talk about yeah. really interesting, I pick the right stuff to talk about. And I think it's about 25 to 30 percent of my success is I don't get into spaces that people don't care about. So when the, when LeBron had an opinion uh about China, remember that? And people well, yeah, of why, course. Why won't you talk about that? Because it's bureaucracy and nobody cares, and you didn't care about Correct. China an hour before this. So, like people talk about the transgender stuff. And my take is, you don't really care about that. I don't know much about it, and you don't care about it, and it doesn't move. Well, so yeah, that so it doesn't move. So I, I found much, that fascinating. I am loyal my whole career. I am loyal to the topic that moves the needle because you could be an expert on hockey. I could know nothing about college football, but I'll beat you because I choose the better topic. And so when I avoid the transgender topics, first they're murky. I let Ethan Strauss had a, a fascinating doctor on in regards to it. And it was, I, I didn't have more clarity or less after 40 minutes of talking, but it was a fascinating listen. And so if I'm not an expert on something, if it's murky or it's bureaucracy, and I don't think it's interesting. And it's not something so that, so I'm so glad you said that. And I know we're going okay. long. Uh, then there's nothing quicker than all of a sudden let's talk about <laughs> you know, the tra tra transgenderism and whether who should be able yeah. to play what sport and all of that. Um, I was amazed at how dumb some of my colleagues yeah. were last Thursday when the women's boxing match in the Olympics happened. Yeah. So I'm going to give you my right. day. Okay. Yeah. I wake up Thursday morning. I have the podcast, then the TV show. I check Twitter. I see what everybody sees. Some people are like, a man beat up a woman and she cried. Some people are like, uh, it, 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 what do you see? This woman loses all the time in boxing and was born a woman. Here's a picture of her as a kid. And some people were like, no, they, she's she switched sex at birth. And then people are like, no, they're not at birth. Pardon me. And then it'd be I'm like, hmm, okay, well. I'm certainly not going to get to the bottom of this story in the next <laughs> half hour. Luckily, it's women's boxing at the Olympics, which was not going to be in the rundown ever. It was not, you know, the, the, somebody beat uh, uh, Gab. Or, I'm sorry, or Simone Biles in, in you know in something we were talking about. It's not something involving the men's basketball team. We were never going to talk right. about the women's ever. boxing at the Olympics ever. It was not in the zeitgeist. It's not like the audience like, oh, you promised us that tomorrow you're going to break down the match. Now you're afraid of it. So why don't I give this a few hours and see what the actual information is and then decide if I want to talk about it tomorrow or the next yeah. day. And then I did. And I'm like, God damn, man, this thing's complicated. Like definitely not a transgender issue at all. But also if I'm to believe the Russian Boxing Federation, which, by the way, I don't believe, um, but it seems to be compelling evidence. She might have been born DSD, a little confused, yes. but it also seems like so. So wait, so she definitely woman, been a woman her whole life, by the way, from a conservative Muslim na nation where transgender is not a thing because not allowed. But did she have a physical advantage? Oh, OK, I get that argument. Um, all right. I now have the information still a little confused. Yeah. Luckily, um, I I'm under no obligation to talk about this because again, it's the quarterfinals of the women's boxing <laughs> at the Olympics. So we'll just let this one pass. And the amount of people that were like, 
prominent people that were like, well, it's fucking showing up on Elon Musk's propaganda machine. So I, it must be the story to talk about. So I'm going to, on the front end, be like, I don't know what I'm talking about, but let's talk about it. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like, what? You, you, you. And the reason, like you said, the reason folks, I believe, talked about that, knowing they didn't know anything, was because they didn't want people to tweet to them, you're afraid to talk right. about it. They didn't, they, they were trying to get out in front of, and I'm going to say one other thing on this, because the, the justification a lot that certain folks make when they talk about stuff before they have all the information or they're wrong is, listen, I say on the front end, I don't know everything, you know, it's kind of casual, I'm not that bright, whatever it is. Always be leery of folks who every time they make one of those mistakes is slanted in the same direction. Right. If you're just a dumb guy that's just like, hey, we're just talking, then you'll make mistakes in both directions. Then sometimes you'll say something that that is wildly wrong on the conservative side, and sometimes you'll say things that are wildly wrong on the liberal side. Sometimes you'll say things wildly wrong on you know the, the the you'll vary your mistakes in my experience what tends to happen is folks consistently make this mistake slanted in the same direction of the people yelling at them on the internet yeah. and then they're like well i told you i'm not that bright I'm like yeah i don't know seem bright enough to never make the mistake in the other direction so in some certain things you're okay on so yeah, I was I called Demonze, my son, who I do the podcast with, that night. I was like, man, I was like, we should be proud of the podcast we did today. He's like, why? I was like, because we didn't make the mistake so many well, people made, which was talk about a serious real life issue yeah. that, by the way, that's a real human being that has to go back to her country, all of it. Um when we had none of the information yeah. just because Twitter was yelling at us to well, do it. Well, it, it's, um, I had texted Bob Costas once. He was on Bill Maher talking about this and he used the word murky. And I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, not suspicious, but, uh, I'm, I'm very, um, unimpressed by people who have strident positions on difficult topic. So I, I actually interviewed with a friend of mine, Joe Donlan had a podcast. He's debuting in Chicago. He asked me about it. And, and my take was, and again, I'm not ducking anything. I said, Joe, during COVID, I watched people who worked the checkout at Costco lecturing Dr. Fauci on vaccines. Like that's embarrassing. Like I don't know everything. It saved lives. It could have come from a lab. I don't know. And I told him in re regards to this, I said, I have to trust the IOC. They have medical boards. I said, these governing bodies on these incredibly difficult situations, it's not like the same decision you had deciding um, where to put the restrooms in a stadium. Like it's not, they literally yeah, spent I, I, hours, I just... days, weeks, knowing this would be difficult. And at some point, I... success matters. Fauci's history matters. Mark Cuban successful. He knows more than you and me on business. Like the Olympic committee didn't just haphazardly say, hey, what do you think? Let's flip a coin. Well, also, here's the other thing. And this is where I'm super skeptical. If you were to be like, Nick, what do you know more than the average person about? And what are you nearly an expert in? Be like, okay, it's a narrow, that's a narrow thing, but I have things. I certainly am almost an expert in broadcasting just because I've done it my whole career. I'm, I think I'm, you know, almost an expert, if not an expert in sports history and, you know, data and information. And I oddly, I'm not an expert, but I know way more than the average person about American history, most notably from 
the beginning of the Civil War to the passage of the Civil Rights Act because that hundred years I've really studied. Other stuff, you know, I just know what I know. Folks that somehow on every hot button issue have it clocked like, oh, you're full of yes. shit. Like you, there's no chance right. you have the the informed opinion on the origin of COVID, how vaccines are made, chromosomal issues in regards to transgenderism, those three topics have nothing to do with each other. You got them all down? Like, that's a very unique set of skills you're dealing with <laughs> here. And by the way, you also seem to, you know, dabble when necessary in, you know, the best ways to put down social unrest within a city if there's a riot, you know that one. Who the next vice president of the United States should be picked based on electoral maps, you know that one. I'm like, you're all phony experts. You're all, you all well, are just think so about this. confident. You know Michael everything. Jordan couldn't hit a baseball. And he's arguably the best athlete in NBA history. Couldn't hit a baseball. I mean, Randy Moss tried to play basketball. So did Roy Jones. Guys. Oh, I left one. Oh, sorry. I left one out. By the way, in the middle of those other things, you became a legit expert on Eastern European wars <laughs> and the best way to litigate those. Like, I don't, I, I don't believe you. I just don't, but I, what I believe is, you know, the way you want the world to right. be and you will pretend you have the expertise to give yourself the authority on how well, it I've should told you, and I've so, told you there's an explosion. This will take a few minutes, but there's been an explosion in conspiracy theories over the last 10 years, and it's actually very explainable. I mean, there was always the occasional conspiracy theory. Yeah. It is now an epidemic. Why? Because conspiracy theorists need an explanation for all the cultural changes. We've had more cultural changes due to the technology that is in front of us than ever before. And people, studies have shown that our conspiracy theorists tend to need answers. They're not as culturally relevant. They're not as socioeconomically relevant. They're not as popular as they think they deserve. And so they need answers. And so they say, well, this is why this is happening. It's rigged. Not even elections, just yeah. So what, what you're finding, Everything. there's an explosion of conspiracy theories, and they're by people that want simple answers that things changed, and they can't explain it. And I mean, they, they're doing studies on conspiracy theories. Why are they exploding? And it's because tech has, I mean, good God, in my business, in the last three years, the whole fucking thing has turned upside down. The whole, My whole business, I mean, podcasts didn't exist. Now, I own a company. You know, that's a podcast company. I mean, the whole yep. world's changed. Uh, radio and cable TV, my favorites, they're regressing fast, quickly. So again, it, it, it's when I, I have gotten to a point where the, con, uh, the conspiracy theory guy is, it's like sports fan, every time their team loses says, well, it was rigged or it's the officials. I just don't have time. Like I've just, I know I people like to. Joe Rogan, but it's like, Joe, not everything's a conspiracy. Come on. Well, but so listen, and again, I'm fine with healthy skepticism. Same. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with, you know what I mean? With not taking, you know, just what the government tells you as gospel Agreed. immediately as they tell you. I'm fine with, I'm fine with it's all healthy. of that. What, right. What I'm, what I'm... <laughs> Honestly, and this is, and then I'll, you know, this is finish the glass of wine, which means I'm probably being maybe a little more casual with my thoughts than I otherwise would be. What I'm not fine with is people that I know to be dumb pretending they have figured out super complicated issues. I'm just not okay with it. And you mentioned, and I'm not, listen, I'm not trying to shit talk Joe Rogan, but. I I saw, you know, the clips from his last stand-up, the one that just came yeah. out. And I'm like, man, this is the guy? This guy is the one that is shaping public opinion 
on really important things, the guy that thought it was on the board that the State of the Union was a taped speech because he hadn't quite figured out the entire Congress, including 250 Republicans are there standing or booing or clapping. <laughs> that guy's a thought leader on everything. By the way, Joe Rogan, definitively thought leader and deserved on UFC stuff, how to build a popular podcast. Maybe number one draft pick in the world on those two topics. You don't get to be the thought leader on every topic. I mean, I guess you do, but you're not it's you're not going to be credible. And that's why that's why to bring it back to where you started on this, I don't he, there so many times people are like you're afraid to talk about. And the answer is no. I who have a pretty big ego have the humility to know, man, there's people that know a hell of a lot more about this than me. I'm going to let them figure it out, at least the beginning parts of it, before I form my opinion. And it's so hard right now for folks to, A, agree on what a trusted source is in order to get the data to form an opinion. And it's so hard for people to say, man, that one's hard. That one's complicated. Nobody wants nothing. For some reason, nothing's allowed to be complicated. Like I, again, I will, I'm going to wade into really murky ground, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. And I'm not afraid to. I think basically all foreign wars are complicated. And I haven't dedicated my life to figuring (laughs) that out. I just haven't. I know some people have, and I'm a really smart guy. I don't know much about a lot of the rest of the world. I know nothing about warfare and the number of people who just confidently say, no, this is black and white and simple. And here's how you fix it. Like, here's how you fix it. Like, man, if it was that easily fixable, I think it'd have been fixed. Like, I'm not acting like nothing is, is simple, but the amount of people that just rush to this super complicated issue. Well, that multiple PhDs are trying to figure out, I solved during my lunch break. I just don't buy, I just don't trust those people. Yeah, I, I mean. just don't trust those people and don't think they should be taken seriously. I just watched the documentary on Iran Contra, Oliver North, and it was so good and so fascinating. And it took years and years and years for it to get uncovered. They still don't have all the answers, but. Where was that? What was that on? What uh, service? I think it do you was, know? I think it was Netflix. I mean, I, I basically in the football season, I don't watch it. And then once the football season ends, I watch it every day. Like my, my viewing is football, yeah, Labor Day yeah. until Super Bowl. And then I just go documentaries, Netflix. That's where yep. I go. And so, and I, by the yep. way, I don't have time. I, I get one or two really good books a year, um, maybe three. And I do it when I fly. That's why I like to fly. It forces me to sit down and, you know, really dive into a book. I'm going to do it this week when I fly to Chicago. But my my history books are documentaries. And I'll watch two, like, like I'll watch two or three on a Saturday before I go out. Love it. Yeah. Yep. Love it. Th- th- by the way, that's the, the, I'll give one, I'm going to plug one, one podcast that's not mine or yours, mm-hmm. but is a, It's a popular ones, but it's also, there's a podcast called Hardcore History. I think the guy releases three a year. They're four to five hours long. And when, like, I listen to them when I play poker. And it's, you know, it's like, hey, you ever wondered how Alexander the Great became Alexander the Great? Well, here's four hours on his father. For real. <laughs> like, and, and that's what it is. And it's this guy basically reading you a book on de- you know, world history, but it's, you know, his podcast. But I'm the the reason I thought of that is I love that podcast, but during football season, I I can't even listen to that. During football because during football season, I'm wa- there's so much watching of football, consuming football information, doing all this stuff, and then those other six months a year. 
I can try to become a well-rounded human being. Uh, but you know, I only got a month left because then football's coming again. Remember when the Hollywood writers went on strike and every that th that lasted? Remember that? I had a theory. Yeah, of course. That Netflix knows when it gains and loses subscribers. The streaming services all do, and one of the reasons that this this strike was happening a big chunk of it during the football season is they wanted to clean up all their books because when the streaming services started remember you 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 were okay. trying you yeah. were trying to buy who could buy the globe first who could win the global race yeah because we'd maxed out on domestic subscribers and so all of them blew through their budgets only none of them even netflix for a long time didn't make any money and eventually they're like okay the subs are we've kind of reached we've reached mass consumption yeah. and they looked at their books and said shit we got to clean these up all of them did outside of netflix they all had to so they decided to strike during the football season saying this is the time that nobody we lose subs we're yeah. not going to do right people are watching football we're not going to do yeah. heavy production during this time we're just going to rerun a lot of our stuff because this is the time of the year that it, it, the people that watch us don't like sports. If you do, we just lose men. And then the minute you get close yeah. to the end of the football season, they got the strike figured out. They're like, okay, now we have to create new stuff because here yeah. come the men and women back into our streaming service. And that was my, um, you know, that was my, that was my yeah, I mean, listen, I don't know. I, listen, like, I don't know if that's, Totally right, totally wrong, or somewhere in between. But it's a good theory. I, I no, by the way, whether it's right as, or wrong, I like the theory. I don't, you know, as I say, Joe Rogan has a few too many conspiracy theories. That's my big one. And, and yeah, but so that's the thing. And this is where we can leave it because you and I both do traffic in somewhat wacky ideas, theories. Hey, this occurred to me. But to go back to where we started, it's all about the fluff of life. Like, I don't, I feel entitled, entitled is the wrong word, but I'll use it. I feel totally entitled to come on your show and be like, hey, I just got a feeling Dak and Bill Belichick are going to be both with the Giants next yeah. year. And, by, and, and, and if someone's like, what's that based on? I'm like, my gut, it makes sense. I know enough about Bill and Dak and the salary cap that it's plausible. And I just think it makes sense. But if you were to really push me on it, like, well, have you talked to anyone? No, of course not. Have you, do you know Bill? No. Do you know Dak? No. Do you know the Mara family? No. I just, it's my gut feeling. So really, I don't know anything, but it makes sense, and I and I truly think it's going to happen. What I wouldn't do is be like, "Here's why the vaccine was a fraud." <laughs> it's like, "Oh, was it? Have you studied it, it, this? No. Have you? Did you talk to anyone? No. Did, did do you do you know any? No. I'm just guessing. It's just my gut because that shit matters." Right. Like it's, I think having wacky, fun, gut feeling sports theories, theories. It's one of the best things about being about sport in yes. sports. It's like, oh, if I'm wrong, the day, and then I, then we should go. It's been ninety minutes. the The biggest day of my career was July fourth, twenty sixteen, filling in for you because three minutes before the show started, Kevin Durant picked the Warriors, and ESPN and ESPN two was in Wimbledon. I was filling in for you because it's 4th of July. And the biggest story in the sports world, I'm the only per you know, I'm we're the only network doing it. And I it's my second time ever filling in for you. And I still to this day think that day changed my whole career. The herd popped a huge number. I I handled it well and whatever. That day on the air, on the air, biggest day of my career, I floated the idea. That what if this is just a double cross Kevin Durant was doing? This has been lost to the history, which was because when because Durant couldn't sign yet, he could just verbally commit. But in order to do that, the Warriors had to let Harrison Barnes leave. And I was like, what if Durant 
is actually planning on staying with Oklahoma City, but they just blew a 3-1 <laughs> lead to Golden State, and he wants to make them worse. So he tells them I'm coming. They let Harrison Barnes leave. And then on July 7th, when he can sign, he does the ultimate villain move, which is like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying with the Thunder. To this day, it's one of my favorite sports theories ever. It was totally ridiculous. It had no chance. He wrote an article for the whatever the Players Tribune. But I really believed. I was like, I know legally he can do this. <laughs> It would be an amazing thing. And I talked about it on the air 30 minutes after he signed with the Warriors. I was like, unless yeah. it was just wacky, goofy Fun. stuff. Yeah. But it's sports. Yeah. So who gives a right. shit? Like, it's totally fine. That's why our job's the best. My most important day was this moment, because I live in the moment, and this podcast. Okay. <laughs> this guy. What a, what a <laughs> jerk. The best. All right, buddy. This was great. It was great. I'll talk to you later. See you. <laughs> See Bye. you later.